Okay, so this is the first uh, full A-level specimen paper that I've done. It's from, there are two, so in case you don't know, there are two sets of specimen papers. One set is available to the public, which is this set here. Um, the other set is locked away um, for use by teachers as, as, as mock papers or whatever. So I'm not going to touch uh, that second set because I don't think it's fair. Um, but first set, I'm going to do paper one, two, and three. It's a two-hour paper. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 105 marks, so you're not working quite at a mark a minute, but it's not far off. You're certainly not, you're not getting to a, a mark and a half, sorry, a minute and a half per mark, but you've got to work fairly swiftly. Um, this one's focusing primarily on the inorganic, um, and there'll be some stuff on the physical chemistry uh, as well, which is sort of scattered across this, so thermodynamics will be in here. Uh, I think acids and bases is. It's best to look at the specification and work out what's going to be in it. Um, but this is this is much more of a theory paper. There might be a bit of practical and stuff in there, but it should be predominantly sort of theory based around, I say, inorganic and uh, physical. So, make a start. Another stuff there. Okay, so first, but explain how the electron pair repulsion theory can be used to deduce the shape of and the bond angle in PF3. I'm not going to go through every single question uh, in terms of the in-depth theory behind it. I'm going to look at the exact the actual answer the question itself um, and hopefully do this in, in about an hour and a half as opposed to two hours. Um, so this is an AS level question or a year one question which is uh, strictly speaking just straight into bonding, shapes and molecules. Um, we're looking for well what ha what essentially is leading us to deduce the shape of PF3. So it's an explain so you've therefore got to give reasons. You're told what the what the obviously the compound is. Uh, we know we want to use, we want the shape and we want the bond angles. So that's probably going to carry two marks as well. And then we're explaining where those things come from. So it's something. If I was to do this personally, what I'd do is I'd look at PF3, I'd say, right, well, phosphorus being on the periodic table in group five. Yeah, group five. I'm trying to remember the top of my head now. I think it's in group five. So we'd say it's got five electrons in its outer shell. This is how I would always work out a shape. So I'd say five electrons in the outer shell. Fluorine's coming in, so each fluorine gives one electron each. Therefore it's going to be three. So at this point the total electrons is going to be eight. That's, that's how I would always look at it. Um, we've got three fluorines bound so we've got bonded we've got three bonding pairs um, which is which is fine which is going to equate for six electrons whereas we've got eight here so therefore we must have one lone pair of electrons as well the way actually I would normally do this so I'd say at this point here total eight divide that by two equals four electron pairs so therefore, we've got three bonding pairs and one lone pair. So there's going to be loads of marks there so far. Uh, looking at the mark scheme, we're probably scoring about three marks at this point out of six. We've not talked about what the shape is. And we've not talked about the bond angle. So six marks is going to be quite easy. This bit here, we've not mentioned this idea of the electron pair repulsion theory at all. And, and the, the reality here is that all of these electron pairs um, are going to repel. And they're going to do so as far away basically as possible as possible each of these electron pairs the lone pair and you should be very aware of this at this point the lone pair is um, repels more okay so there's more repulsion coming from the lone pair so we're already at five marks here um, We've got two more marking points, which is clearly the shape of and the bond angle. So knowing that we've got three bonding pairs and one lone pair, we've got a trigonal pyramid or trigonal pyramidal shape and our bond angle. If we were dealing with our tetrahedral, so a bond shape here, what we've got is we've got phosphorus like this essentially with our fluorine and then we've got our lone pair there. Shape normally if this was tetrahedral we'd be looking at 109.5 but because of the extra repulsion there we've got 109.5 minus 2.5 and that's going to give us a bond angle of 107 degrees. I would make this point here that the 109.5 is 
they're going to be 107 based on the fact that it's down from uh, the two and a half extra repulsion from the phosphorus. And that's straight away quite intense, you know, 1.1 straight away into a six mark question but there's not actually that much work there at all quite an easy one to get marks on uh, and there you go hopefully with six marks in let's keep going okay let's take the full electron configuration of a cobalt two ion in this situation i would always work out i really should have a periodic table on me that would that would help massively at this point um, i would always work out what the electron configuration would be of the of the atom and then i'd work backwards so the atom here one s 2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and I always write out like this because this this for me is, is a much easier uh, 4s2, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d7, 4s2, right, because it's a cobalt 2 ion, that's going to essentially be this guy here, 2 plus means we've lost 2 electrons, working numerical order back, losing these electrons, therefore it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 and you could abbreviate this I believe oh no sorry no you can't full you can't do that 2p6 3s2 3p6 3d7 one really really easy mark there okay so just one reason why electron pair repulsion theory cannot be used to predict the shape of the COCl4 2 minus ions this is one of our complexes well, obviously we're in inorganic chemistry it's a suggest question, which means it's not really necessarily a hard and fast answer. Maybe not all not the one you necessarily would have come across in le in lessons. If you were to look at this, essentially what we've got is we've just got too many electrons in um, in particularly our D subshell. So too many electrons. In the D subshell, we only use our shaping only really works when we're looking at the S block and the P block. It doesn't work when it comes to the um, the idea of uh, transition metals. And if you worked this out, you would find that although this is a tetrahedral shape, you would not find that that is actually the case. You'd have all sorts of lone pairs and, and things. It'd be a nightmare to, to work out. So it's that's the reason there are too many electrons uh, in the D subshell. 1.4, predict the shape of and the bond angle in the complex rhodium ion, RHCl42-. Well, straight away, really easy. Standard, the fact that we've got the four chlorines bonded there, shape, tetrahedral, and bond angle, no different to anything else. So this is, what's quite nice here is this, a, this is almost like a year two twist, and it's the end of the question, so we'd expect that on the year one stuff, but it's exactly the same. 109.5, tetrahedral shape, no problem. Next question, so we're on to question two. I have no idea how many questions there are. Judging by that, there's quite a few. Explain why the atomic radii of the elements decreases across period three from sodium to chlorine. Another year one question, so it seems to be following this pattern. I've not ever done this paper or looked at this paper before, so this is the first time. So it seems to be following a pattern of year one, then progressing toward year two. So, really nice question. Loads of room here, not needed. As we go across the period, we add, uh, we add protons into the nucleus so we add protons um, and that's going to give us an increasing nuclear charge which is fairly useful I guess in this particular idea of element size decreasing um, and what I mean <laughs> there's only a two mark answer you could also talk about shielding constant throughout although actually there isn't a mark for that but I think it's a good point to make that the shielding doesn't change um, so protons in the nucleus that increase the nuclear charge therefore greater attraction between uh, outer electrons and the nucleus which therefore is ultimately going to constrict the atom, it's going to become smaller based on that. So why is the melting point of sulphur, S8, why is that greater than phosphorus' S, uh, P4? Straight away we're looking at molecules here, so we're looking at intermolecular forces. What's our intermolecular force going to be? Well, we've not got hydrogen bonding, we've not got a dipole on the, on the go here, so we're looking for van der Waals forces, and of course you should know that the bigger a molecule is, the greater it's van der Waals. S8 is going to be bigger than P4, so S8 bigger <clears throat> P4. That's our first bit there. And so, therefore, van der Waals 
stronger. It's got to be a comparative answer here because it's explaining why one is greater than the other. So van der Waal is stronger in S8 than P4, and that is going to give us a higher melting point for S8. Two easy marks. It's ramping up here. Explain why sodium oxide forms an alkaline solution when it reacts with water. Right. So in this case here, this is sort of slight, I think, moving more towards the the idea of I'm trying to think if this is year two or not. Nah. So sodium oxide, it's the oxide ions are the are the key parts. And what that's gonna happen is these are ultimately these guys here are going to react with water and they are going to form hydroxide ions. So you could write an equation for this. You could say that that's going to happen. Um, and that would be fine, it's all balanced and stuff. Or you could give that, that would score you both marks, or you could do it in a wordy way. Oxide ions uh, are going to react with water to produce OH minus ions. I'd say stick with an equation because that basically gives it the explanation is all there. If you want to put some words to supplement that, do so. Two reasonably easy marks there. Um, very much heading towards the year two stuff now. Right now, look equation for the reaction of phosphorus five oxide with an excess of sodium hydroxide solution. So, phosphorus five oxide, P4O10, we're reacting it with sodium hydroxide solution. Uh, and we're basically going to be producing our phosphate ions and water. I'm equating the reaction of phosphorus fiber oxide with an excess of sodium hydroxide solution. This is one of those equations that I think you've just sort of really, you've just got to know. Um, and it's the, the whole period three oxides and reactions. I hate it as a topic. I think it's really bitty. But you can see they're just throwing a little one mark question in there. Um, I suppose it ties into the sodium oxide part as well. Um, it, it's, it, I, I hate it. Uh, it needs balancing up though. Um, for the uh, twelve six one mark. If you don't get that one because you don't like it, it's not the end of the world. One mark. Uh, okay, so this is very much year two now. <coughs> Fuel cells are increasing important energy, blah, 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 blah. So looking at fuel cells and things, we've got a big uh, electrochemical series here. Um, nice table with loads of data. Going from positive through to negative, make sure you're aware of that. So straight away thinking at this, looking at this bottom part being where oxidation preferentially will be taking place. And our top half where we've maybe got some more reduction happening. So it shouldn't be too, shouldn't be too challenging there. Let's see how the questions work. Well, we've got a salt bridge was used in a cell to measure electro potential. Explain the function of the salt bridge. Salt bridge, standard question. Ions move through the salt bridge to complete basically the circuit. Uh, I'll write these as the two separate marks to complete the circuit without the salt bridge. And you can do this. You imagine it's one of the um, it's one of the assessed practicals. Um, you know, if you don't use a salt bridge, whether that be a nice little sort of bit of a tubing, or whether it just be a bit normally sort of a wet piece of a uh, wet piece of cloth or towel, uh, it has to be there. Otherwise, there is no there is no complete circuit. So nice easy marks there. Fairly standard straight away. Just taking that directly from the uh, from hopefully you're learning your revision. Uh, three, two here. Use the data from table one to deduce the halide ion that is the weakest reducing agent. Right. So remember, on this case, now I have to get my head around this. Weakest reducing agent. So a reducing agent is itself oxidized. You know, use the space on these papers if if you want. So it is self oxidized. So essentially, we're looking for. The one that's less likely to be oxidized would be the most positive. So we're looking for the most positive electropotential, and it's of course got to be a halide ion, which I think is a bit of a giveaway because it's a bit, it's a bit rubbish actually. It's got to be that. What I would prefer would be, you know, give the name of the species. And actually, I like the idea of in this question you're having to work out if it's the F2 or the F minus. They've said it's got to be halide ion, so the answer is just quite simply. F minus there, uh, they've actually given that away. People might miss that, I suppose. 3.3, uh, use the data from table one to justify why sulfate ions should not be capable of oxidizing bromide ions. <coughs> Excuse me. So I've got a cough and I keep trying to get rid of it and it's uh, it's not a cough, it's like my throat's dying. Uh, 
sulfate ions should not be capable of oxidizing bromide ions. So, bromide ions are this one, sulfate ions are this one. So, just check again. So, why sulfate ions should not be capable of oxidizing bromide ions? So, we would be saying that the sulfate ions would be, if they're oxidizing, this would be the most positive. So clearly that isn't true, is it? This is not this is not the most positive. This is the most negative of the two. Therefore, this would not happen, by the way, because this is not the most positive. We would we'd assume that uh, we would assume that oxidation would occur there, and therefore those would be reduced as opposed to what the question's asking. So use data there. Uh, we could just say, let's scroll back up again. Yeah, so the SO4, SO2 is smaller than, they like these kind of answers in exams, the bromine, bromide one here. It's not an explanation, it's just justifying it, it's just give give a reason basically. Um, calculate a value for the EMF of a hydrogen oxygen fuel cell operating under alkaline conditions. So you've got to spot your correct number here, hydrogen oxygen fuel cell operating under alkaline conditions, so I'm probably going to say that's my first one there. Uh, and I'd probably say that's going to be my second one. I can see straight away my numbers there. We're going to be 1.23. A little bit of space for working there. If you do want to work it out, it's basically going to be uh, 0.4. minus 0.83. So there you go. One easy mark. <clears throat> there are two ways to use a hydrogen. Uh, use a hydrogen. Use hydrogen as a fuel for cars. One way is in a fuel cell. Blah, 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 blah. blah. The other is in a fuel, is a fuel and internal combustion engine. So, why is, what's the major advantage using this? The classic one really, and it's a suggest question as well, the, the classic one is that essentially um, you are able to use more of the energy, and I'll say obviously not produced, more of the energy that's released from the reaction of the hydrogen and oxygen is, is used, it's not wasted. Um, so I would say less wasted energy um, I think would be fine, less wasted energy. Um, the, the combustion engine obviously there's there's energy going all over the shop in terms of the, the heat that's lost and things so I think less waste energy will be fine but it's a suggest question one mark there uh, question four okay look straight away this is some of the year one stuff energetics um, what do we got going on here we've got a question that's talking about a medical equation for this so it's catalyst so it might be having some catalysis come back to that in a bit so we're given a nice equation here I'm looking to use the enthalpy change the reaction and data Oh no. Use the enthalpy change to the reaction and data from table 2 to calculate a value for the HH bond enthalpy. Oh, I hate questions like this. So, essentially, we're using this here, we're using our bond enthalpies, but rather than calculate the enthalpy change, we've got to calculate the uh, bond enthalpy of that particular bond. So, if we were to write out here the, what we've actually got, I would, I would always say draw out. Um, the molecules just because it makes it a little bit I think I think a little bit easier uh, HH CH308 so we've got methanol and then so is that all balanced up yeah and that's going to be minus 49 okay Put some numbers here. So this is going to be two times seven four three. We don't know. This is going to be three times what I'll call x. This is going to be one two three times the CH bond, which is four twelve. It's going to be a one CO, and it's going to be an OH. This one's going to be OH, which is going to be four six three times 2 and we know that's going to overall equal minus 49. Now the way I would always do this um, is I would say these are all positive values, these are all negative values and in terms of an algebra sense 
you could just say essentially I probably won't do all the uh, work in here but you could say that add 3x you could just do it as a minus it's up to you add 3 times minus 4 12 add minus 360 add minus 463 add 2 times minus 463 equals minus 49 without doing the exact all the work in here all you're going to do here is rearrange this so you get 3x equals something and then you divide by 3 to give you the value of x which is going to be in this case the hydrogen hydrogen bond there and what you end up with is 483 kilojoules per mole Nice question here, classic one here. So you comparing these, the data book value is is basically 436, whereas you've calculated 483. Suggest so one reason why this value is different from your answer to question 4.1. Well, what you've got to appreciate is that the data book is giving it a value for the HH bond enthalpy, whereas we're actually calculating from mean bond enthalpies. So, I an answer something like um, mean bond enthalpies averaged over range of compounds, therefore not the same as actual bond enthalpy which is what the value in the data book there is giving you as an actual bond enthalpy of 436 so and a question that gives the idea of really mean bond enthalpies are different actual bond enthalpies and the reason is that they're averaged over a range of compounds 4.3 suggests one environmental advantage of manufacturing methanol fuel by this reaction let's have a look So medical scientists are developing new chloride catalyst. Okay, so basically we're 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 using carbon dioxide. So one environmental advantage. Well, we are using CO two in the reaction, and that's an environmental advantage because it obviously reduces climate change and all the rest. So the CO two is being used. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of, I guess in, in it it's not, but it's sort of like a carbon neutral type thing, that the methanol that's potentially going to be used uh, as a fuel, well, the carbon dioxide, you know, that it would it would burn and release is actually being used in its creation, so it's it's not releasing any net, there's no net change really. Um, use Le Chatelier's principle to justify why the reactions carry out at high pressure rather than at atmospheric pressure. So it's only relating to pressure, nothing to do with temperature, which is great. So we're looking at pressure here. It's an equilibrium, so of course we've got that. And it's saying, sorry, uh, why is it carried out at high pressure? Why is it carried out at high pressure? So we obviously want to produce more of this. Classic answer, four moles or molecules on that side, two on this side. So say that um, two moles forms four moles that would be my starting thing or two moles on the left four moles on the right um, and something like uh, high pressure shifts equilibrium right to oppose increase in pressure so why do they bother doing that therefore methanol yield is higher now I think I've actually got about four marks worth there but there's only a three mark question so methanol yield higher that's the reason industrially why we bother in doing that so classic sort of year one I suppose tying into year two with KP and things uh, year one at equilibria question uh, suggests why the catalyst used in this process may become less efficient if the carbon dioxide and hydrogen contain impurities so it's a nice suggest question I don't think gives you much detail back here 
It's a catalyst to convert these emissions. No, it's a, it's a really it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's your your standard sort of uh, catalytic poisoning question in that you could say catalyst is poisoned. Uh, Mark scheme will allow that. Um, or if you want to be sort of better, really, uh, impurities block active sites. And if you're a, a biologist, you'll appreciate the term active site in relation to enzymes, which are essentially biological catalysts. Same principle. A catalyst works normally by actually providing a surface uh, for the reaction to take place on. If that surface is blocked for whatever reason by an impurity, then of course there will be no reaction and therefore the catalyst is, is, is not doing a good job. It's becoming much less efficient. This question continues forever, it would seem. Seven marks! In a laboratory experiment to investigate the reaction shown in the equation below, one mole of carbon dioxide and three moles of hydrogen were sealed into a container. After the mixture had reached equilibrium at a pressure of 500 kilopascals, the yield of methanol was 0.86 moles. Blah, 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 blah. Calculate the value for Kp and give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures and give units with your answer. Right, well, straight away, I know what my significant figures are going to be. Nailed that one. That's going to be two, I believe. I'm going to put that there with a question mark because I've got two here. I've got possibly three there, but we'd. we'd bit of a weird one it's certainly limited by the fact that this is to two these are to two as well so i think we're going to do it to two significant figures calculate a value for kp so we're given a pressure and we're given molar values so okay so this, we're going to have to work out our molar values at equilibrium now i like I'm, i'll stick with the order of this here i like to work on this thing sort of like t0 and t1 t0 being time before reaction has taken place. So in this case, I've got one mole and I've got three moles. This is before any reaction has taken place. And of course, I've not got any careful of the, of the quirky questions where they have products added in as well, but they don't. So my products are all formed by this reaction, which is yet to take place. However, at equilibrium, I am told that there is 0.86 moles. This is my time one is at equilibrium. 0.86 moles of methanol. So I've now got to work out, right, well, where's this 0.86 come from? So if I look at this and I look at my ratios, I know that one to one reaction is the carbon dioxide to the methanol. So I know that 0.86 moles of methanol must have come from reacting 0.86 moles of CO2. Well, because I started with one, my therefore at equilibrium must be 0.14, because it's 1 minus 0.86. This is going to be, different one here is going to be, oh, so here ratio of, if I know 0 0.86 is reacted of this, then I know that three times 0 0.86 must have reacted and taken that away from my three moles there. So I'm going to have, oh, I don't know what that is, three point, uh, 0 0.86, I don't know, three minus, oh no, what was that, three minus, uh, three times 0 0.86, uh, 0.42 and of course the ratio is being 1 to 1 to 1 this is going to be 0 0.86 as well so these are the things, these are the values that I want that's a first step, that's going to score you a whole 1 mark in this 7 mark question, 7 marks is incredible um, so we need to work out our total moles of gas because now we're going to have to work out our partial pressures so total moles this question, blah, 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 add them all together, is going to be 2.28. We know that our uh, pressure, given the question, is 500 kilopascals. Well, we now need to work out our partial pressures, which is going to be our mole fraction. Um, time is by the pressure. Now, our mole fraction, remember, is the moles divided by total moles. So, essentially, I'm going to do each one of these divided by 2.28 times 5 hundred. So, oh, this is a faff, isn't it? This is going to be 0 0.14 divided by, if I just stick with these things there, 2.28 times 500. This one's going to be 0 0.42 divided by 2.28 times 500. This one, luckily, it's just going to be the same, but we want to obviously do each one. 0 0.86 divided by 2.28 times 500. 
and the same is going to be true for that one. Uh, when we work those out, we should find, as if by magic, that this one is going to be 30.7, this one is going to be 92.1, and these both are going to be 188.6. These are my partial pressures for each one of these. This is PCO2, PH2, CH3OH, and PH2O. Now, finally, we need to do our equilibrium expression. We need to obviously put those numbers in. So KP is going to be equal to PCH3OH multiplied by pH2O divided by pCO2 okay careful of the 3H 3H2 there it's going to obviously be cubed put our numbers in oh dear me essentially it's going to be 188.6 squared because it's the same number this is going to be 30.7 times 92.1 cubed. And we come out with a value of 1.4... Blah, 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 times 10 to the minus 3, which is going to be, of course, two significant figures, as I said at the start. The reason it's two is because we have two significant figures there, two given there, two given there, and there's nothing lower than that, so that's our limiting number of significant figures, so it's going to be... 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Units wise, I love these questions, um, we know that our units here are kilopascals for our partial pressures. Now we we can say essentially that units wise, how do I best to do this, it would be KPA squared divided by KPA times KPA cube so I know that, that will cancel and it will get rid of that and just have it so it's kPa times kPa but it's 1 over kPa squared therefore it's going to be kPa to the minus 2 and that should get you 7 glorious glorious marks that's a really really good mark uh, answer mark question I've oh, got to get it right brain turn to mush that's a really good question to get marks on that's not a very difficult question provided you understand what you need to do and you are aware of KP really nice short easy topic straight away loads of good marks there okay we're probably we're not quite halfway through yet oh, this is long table 3 contains some entropy data ah, so to thermodynamics now classic thermodynamics now Table 3 contains some entropy data relevant to the reaction used to synthesize methanol from carbon dioxide and hydrogen. They are loving these reactions. What's the obsession with this? Every question's like it's all about carbon dioxide and methanol. Um, we're going to have a temperature. That's going to be quite useful in a bit. Uh, we are given loads of entropy data and we are asked to work out the free energy change for this reaction at 250 degrees Celsius. So straight away, I'm saying right, delta G can be delta H minus T delta S. That will carry a mark, which is just ridiculous. Um, we need to work out our delta S. So delta S is going to be usual arc of working this one out. We're going to take these numbers here. We're going to be looking at... Um, that's a bit of a meltdown there. Products minus reactants. So we're going to be looking at 238... Uh, yeah, 238 add 189 minus 214 minus 3 times 131. And that's going to give us an answer of minus 180. So we're given delta H there as well. So if I leave that there, I know that my delta. G is going to be minus 49 minus temperature, which if you remember up there is 250, needs to be converted to Kelvin, add 273 to it, so it's going to be 523 times minus 180, I'll bracketify that. Uh, we have to, oh, almost forgot that, we almost forgot, we have to of course convert as well 
uh, our entropies so they are in kilojoules so you could do that here as a step you could do a divide by a thousand there I'll do it within here there divide by a thousand and we should come out with a value of plus 45.1 kilojoules per mole don't forget that divide by a thousand step is absolutely I think and also it's to say here in a mark scheme units essential so without units you're not going to get the mark here which would be a shame to give away four marks though not a huge amount of work in there probably one of the more difficult topics because it's conceptually quite a strange one but if you can you know if you can get your head around what's going on there then you're open to loads of marks and obviously do use the actual spaces given I'll stick the plus in uh, and kilojoules per mole there good okay calculate a reaction a, a calculate a value of the temperature when the reaction becomes feasible so we know that feasibility occurs when delta G is zero. That is what the feasible point is. So when delta G equals zero, so if we know that delta G is delta H minus T delta S, then at that point there, we can obviously say that delta H is equal to T delta S and therefore we can work out that temperature is delta H over delta S. Bit of tomfoolery, bit of uh, sticking numbers in. We know that delta H is going to be minus 49. We need to do some conversions again there. So it's going to be our same value as before, minus 180 divided by 1000. Uh, and we should come out with a value of finally 272 Kelvin so it's not a particularly difficult question there a uh, bit of rearrangement it's all about this starting point though if you don't know that you're not going to get the rest of it that little g is zero that's the point where feasibility uh, is, is going off 5.3 oh gaseous methanol from this reaction is liquefied by cooling before storage draw a diagram all oh, right I thought it was going to a different diagram draw a diagram showing how the interaction between two molecules methanol Draw a diagram showing the interaction between two molecules of methanol. Explain why methanol is easy to liquefy. It's a fairly vague question there. Draw a diagram showing the interaction. Well, interaction between two molecules, we're looking at IMF, so intermolecular forces. And if you think about the structure of methanol being this guy, I should have just drawn this out, that's ridiculous, I don't know why I bother doing that. We have one of our NOF group, NOF, joined over to hydrogen. Therefore, we do have um, hydrogen bonding occurring. Now, there's no mention in this question of partial charges and all the rest being shown. They're being quite shady as to what the question's alluding to. Stick in your partial charges, though. I'm going to, that's not the easiest way to do this. Do put in your partial charges. Um, Put in your lone pairs, just like any, oh, what are you doing? Just like any normal question that you would do in sort of the year one sort of content. Do uh, put in those in, do put in your, as I say, your partial charges, stick them in there, delta negative and delta positive there. On the other hand, we've got to make sure we rearrange, reorientate the, the other molecule of methanol because it wants to show the interaction. So it's going to be... Delta positive, delta negative. I'll put in those again. And some sort of dotty line interaction between those guys there. Now that diagrams, oh, that voice is going. All right, <coughs> that diagram <coughs> is going to score you uh, three marks. Uh, and so explain why methanol is easy to liquefy. Uh, I'm just I'm reading the mark scheme as as a as a as I'm as I'm looking at this question, and it is a really so explain why methanol is easy to liquefy. The mark here is hydrogen bonding is a strong enough force. Okay, right, yeah, right, I'm with it now. Why is it easy to liquefy? As in, why is it easy to get it from a gas down to a liquid? So the idea is, oh, it's a horrible one to sort of word though. The hydrogen bonding 
Yeah, yeah the, well, the mark scheme actually makes sense now. The hydrogen bonding. Um, is strong enough is the only way to really describe that actually it's a horrible that's a horrible mark to get it's it's essentially what you're saying is it's strong enough that when the when obviously they cool down it, it, it takes over as that as that intermolecular force and it and it holds them together in that liquid state because it is a strong enough force to allow that to happen uh, it's about as best as i can do there it's a bit of a bit of a sketchy answer though but no, i'm gonna leave that yeah i mean that's what the mark scheme saying as well so go with that not a very easy mark to get that explanation one, I don't think. Um, horrible, horrible question. This part, though, three marks fairly easily. Um, just include your partial charges and all the rest of it. Make sure you've got your dotted lines. Okay, question six. So, a question about ammonium chloride dissolved in water can act as a weak acid. That's shown by the following equation. So, it's losing its proton there, which is great, given that up. Figure one shows a graph of data obtained by a student when a solution of sodium hydroxide was added to a solution of ammonium chloride. The pH of the reaction mixture was measured initially and after each addition of the sodium hydroxide solution. Right, okay, so we've got a nice sort of curve here going on. Standard sort of up and then we've got this point there. We've got a bit of a jump there as well. Okay, so just a suitable piece of apparatus that we use to measure out the sodium hydroxide solution. Okay. Ridiculous question, really. So, what? Well, you'd use a burette in any kind of. Well, it was essentially a, a titration. You use a burette. Explain why this is more suitable than a pipette for this purpose. Well, a pipette only measures a stat set volume. It doesn't measure a, a range of volumes. Um, I'd say can measure a range of volumes. That's basically, yeah or deliver a range of volumes, give out, release a range of volumes. It's not just one twenty-five, it can give any any number. This is like quite an easy question, that one. Uh, okay. Use information from the curve in figure one to explain where the end point of this reaction would be difficult to judge accurately using an indicator. Okay. Well, if you look at this, it's not a particularly bit of a weird So it's a bit of a, it's not a very nice sort of pH curve, and the key portion is this bit, really round here, where you've got what you'd hope normally would be a real sort of steep change, but it's not. It's quite a gradual one. You can see it covers pretty much something like that. So it's covering about one centimeter cube, which is in in the realms of normal titrations when you obviously add a tight when you add an you have an indicator and you add just a kind of a couple of drops and there's a big change that's a that's about naught point one centimeter cubes this is about ten times the sort of the the, the volume that's required so end point uh has a gradual change in p h something like that it's it's not a it's not a very distinct it's a quite a gradual one uh therefore indicator wouldn't change color at a particular change color at a particular point i suppose it's kind of working over a range so it's the fact that it is this this kind of like uh, it's 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 changing colour rather than being a definitive. It's going to gradually change over a period, which isn't. You don't want to be adding a centimetre cube and kind of going, oh, is this it? Is this it? Is this it? Is this it? And it's no. You want it to that very definite, which it's not going to do. It's going to be changing sort of over this over this um, this course of volume. 
Okay, the pH at the end point of this reaction is 11.8. Use this pH value in the ionic product of water, Kw equals 1 times 10 to minus 14 mole do, 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 to calculate the concentration of hydroxide ions at the end point of the reaction. Nice. So, so we're going to have to work backwards on this one. We're going to have to initially work out, we know that the pH is 11.8. Well, we're going to have to work out what the hydrogen ion concentration is, and that's 10 to the power of minus pH. So in this case, that's going to be 10 to the power of minus 11.8. And that's going to give us 1.58 times 10 to the minus 12. So it's a standard thing. You need to be able to work both ways, calculate pH, but also calculate H+. So we've got our H+, concentration. Now, if we know that Kw is H+, plus times OH-, minus, and we now know Kw and we know H+, plus, well, we can say... OH minus concentration is going to be KW divided by H plus concentration. So we whack those numbers in. 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 1.58 times 10 to the minus 12. And we end up with a delightful number of 6.3... Oh no. Times 10 to the minus 3. What happens if you hold it down? Oh yeah, it does. That's nice. Anyway. 6.33 times 10 to the minus 3. So it's about understanding what the the equation for the ionic product is. And it's also about then getting that H plus. It's perhaps a tricky sort of initial part working backwards slightly. But three marks there. Nice three marks to get. Question 6 continues. So the expression for the acid association for aqueous ammonium ions is a bit of a weird question this because normally you associate ammonia with alkalis but because they're dealing with the fact that it's the ammonium dissociation being acidic and having a Ka value or it's, it's quite a nice one, I quite like this. Um, anyway, so what we're saying here so just trying to work out where we're going to go with this. So this is a standard sort of weak acid calculation, really. Okay, I can see that's a, bit, oh, that's a sneaky question. Normally in our weak acid calculations, we would say that given that the dissociation, in, in this case, or of any weak acid, is... I like the little underlined plus there, that's nice, isn't it? Not confusing at all, having plus and minus, idiots. If it's uh, dissociating in this particular way there, you would say that because of... There's a couple of assumptions ready to make. Well, not There's one assumption, but one other sort of classic thing. When this associates, it's going to dissociate equally, so this and this are going to be the same. Therefore, you could say that that is true. And an assumption you can make, and you have to really make this assumption, otherwise you can't do it, is that the concentration initially, we would assume that none dissociates at all, which I know is slightly counterintuitive. We assume that none dissociates at all. Therefore, we can say that actually H plus squared is going to be divided by 2, and that's going to be equal to Ka. So we're almost there. We just need to work out what this is going to be. Well, you can work out what your H plus is because you are told that you use the pH of the solution before any sodium hydroxide has been added. So no sodium hydroxide being added would be a, a an amazing value of zero. And we've got 4.246. So 4.6 is our pH initially. Scroll back down, scroll back down. So we're looking at pH equals 4.6. I would write this stuff down. I would, like I've done here, see, there's nothing wrong with this at all. I'm not showing any working. I could have used this space, but I want to use this for my working. pH of 4.6. Well, I need to work out my hydrogen ion concentration. So same as before. It's going to be 10 to the minus pH. It's going to be 10 to the minus 4.6. And that's going to give me a hydrogen ion concentration of 2.51 times 10 to the minus 5. Whack that into here. So I would then say, right, Ka is going to be... And I'd make sure people... You know, I'd make sure you can, you've can you drawn this clearly. I'm showing it all here so it's nice and obvious. Uh, Ka is equal to 2.51 times 10 to the minus 5 squared divided by 2 and you get a final value there of 3.15 times 10 to the minus 10. Nice question this actually, I like that, I've not seen one particularly like that before using the pH curve and backwards but 
not too difficult there. Three marks again, quite a good number of marks for what well, is actually quite a low sort of amount of time. What's this one? A two mark here. So a solution contains equal concentrations of ammonia and ammonium ions. Use your value of Ka. Oh no. Use a value of Ka from question 6.4 to calculate the pH of this solution. Explain your working. Right. I believe this is one of those you can do it sort of the idea of half equivalence uh, is, is another one here. So Okay. Oh, that's quite it's quite an easy one actually, yeah. So if Ka is normally if according to my, my thing before it's NH three H plus and this is NH four plus, yeah, it falls into sort of the idea of half equivalence. Well, we've got a value of Ka, and what we're told, told here, we're told it has equal concentrations of ammonia and ammonium ions. Well, that means, therefore, if these are equal, then they will cancel. Therefore, for this particular instance, not always, but only at this particular point where these are equal, Ka is equal to H+. Plus. Um, and you've got to make that point clear, because it does say, explain your work. And well, there, if I've shown it, I've crossed those out. Those two are equal, therefore Ka is equal to H+. plus. Well, I know what my Ka value is, because I've got 3.15 times 10 to the minus 10, or you've got the value given there. So I would say 3.15 times 10 to the minus 10 is going to equal my H+. Plus. Oh, almost. H plus concentration. What we do then is we essentially just do the minus log of that number and that's going to be my pH and I'm going to get a value of this always do it, it doesn't say I don't think always do it to 2 dp always go two decimal places on that um, it's, it's quite an important one to uh, to do uh, if you were to have used their value you end up getting 8.32 but you know if you're unsure use their value not going to cost you any marks using their value at all it's uh, it's all based on the working really but two quite easy marks there quite nice I enjoyed question six I'm going to sad to see it go. I'm making good good time through the paper now. Oh, we're on to ah, oh, this is the last bit now, I believe. I think we are now into, or am I? Oh no, we're not. It's just they've just randomly thrown some uh, some multiple choice in here. Uh, you will essentially get some little bits of multiple choice. Paper three is going to be where the majority of your multiple choice is going to be, though, which is going to be quite difficult. Um, multiple choice is really hard. But anyway, we'll crack onto this. So questions seven point one and seven point two. Don't do like little eyes. Oh, that was such a great time. Um, which element is calcium? So we've got to use all of these. Bits. Oh, great question. Great question. So we know that we've got elements X, Y, and Z. Um, we've got a choice of three for each one. <whistles> this one's going to be good. We're given the successive ionization energy datas for the different things and we're trying to work out initially which one is calcium so calcium we know uh, is in group two therefore when we remove particularly when we've removed the second electron we should find there's a jump between the second and third as we change main energy levels quantum numbers whatever you want to call them uh, as we change the main energy levels we should have a big jump there so we're looking for one that has a reasonable jump so we've got about about 600 ish between here about 600 ish 600 between there about uh, well we can see the jumps here jumps clearly there you know comparing like for like pretty similar big jump there so I would say why colored in beautifully Colour the whole box in. I'm not going to do that. You don't don't colour the box in. Um, face there, having a great time. Uh, y is going to be calcium because it's the big jump there between this one and this one as we're moving from the uh, outer energy level uh, into the next ring, uh, the next main energy level there. Um, not too bad. Now the next question: uh, Which element is vanadium? So. Let's look at these values again. Bear in mind, vanadium is a transition element, um, and it has. If you think about its electron configuration, that's that's certainly a useful thing to go. And it's going to have. It's going to end at three d three, four s two. So we're looking for something that might be tied into that. Now, transition metals are a bit odd in comparison to our usual groups one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. And that they don't tend to find. 
certainly at the, uh, the, the top end of the, the Ds and, and, and the, the, what, the 3D and the 4S, you don't tend to find as much of a pattern there and you tend to find a bigger pattern between the drop off of the 3D down to the 3P. And if you look for this, that would mean we're looking in the case of vanadium, we're looking for basically a big jump between removing five and then removing the sixth. And that is essentially what we do see here. Uh, not a big big jump there or there. So the big one for these particular elements here, X, Y, and Z, vanadium basically is going to be this one here. This is going to be vanadium. It's it's a difficult one, um, and not one that necessarily you would sort of have a huge amount of understanding about. But it's one that, given that you know calcium is pretty straightforward, it's going to be Y. You know that the other two must be scandium or vanadium. Well, if you look at the patterns of them, scandium is uh, what is it? 3D 1 4S 2 and that same thing is true again that in between removing the th 4S is going to be removed 4S 2 4S 1 this is going to be a 3D 1 electron this is going to now be the 3P 6 and that would be the 3P 6 here you can see there's a big jump between removing the last 3D electron and the uh, the first 3P electron, which is something that basically just is characteristic of transition metals. Difficult thing to necessarily know, and it's probably not something you necessarily would have covered in lessons, but it's about applying, this is towards the end of the paper now, it's about applying your understanding of, in this case, the electron configurations to given data. And realistically, the only one that could be vanadium would be this top one here, scandium being the bottom. So vanadium is gonna be X, then we'll make a move on from that. Tricky question, that though, tricky question. Again, one mark there, uh, all based on electron configurations. Uh, and there we go, justify your choice of vanadium. So what they're suggesting here is that this isn't something that you would necessarily have ever covered before, um, but they're wanting you to use your, your, your ideas, basically, and in, as I say, justify the fact that you've, you've got that, that answer there. Now, as I said earlier on, the reason you know, gone for vanadium there is because it's after that fifth electron being removed, that's the one we're looking for. So um, jump after fifth electron removed, I would say that's going to be the first one there. Um, and it probably fits with the 3D3, 4S2. Yeah, fits with the 3D3, 4S2, basically, the vanadium's got. Um, I think that sort of, that, that matches reasonably well. I don't like the idea of these being the outer shell electrons because I, th I just think it starts getting quite confusing if you're starting thinking, well, these are the outer shell electrons, whereas they're in different main energy levels. Um, so I'm not convinced I like the idea of that, but I think, you know, hopefully that makes some sense. Um, the idea of the fifth and sixth there, the jump between particularly the 3D and the 3P, maybe something to look out for in the future. Uh, okay, this one. An acidified solution of NH4VO3, what reacts with zinc? Uh, explain how observations from this reaction show that vanadium exists in at least two different oxidation states. This is quite a niche question, really, in that you are expected to know about the uh, reactions of the, the vanadate with zinc. And essentially, in this particular instance, without going into sort of huge amounts of detail, um, you'd get two different colours. It says about explain how observations, so what you would see, two different colours. Um, each being a different oxidation state of vanadium. Two nice marks. Question seven continues. Okay, the vanadium in 50 centimeters cubed of a 0.8 multisimeter cube solution of ammonium vanadate reacts with Okay, good, good question. So some maths here, six marks. Use the information to calculate the oxidation state of vanadium in the solution after reduction reaction with sulfur for oxide. Explain your working. I kid you not, this is the hardest question in the history of the world ever. This is ridiculous. Oh my. Right. I've never seen a question like this ever. Uh, 
<laughs> it's just ridiculous. Okay, what you can, there's six marks here. The, the only saving grace here is that you can get two marks by doing really simple maths. So there's a good thing. So you could work out the moles of vanadium and you can work out the moles of sulfur 4 oxide, which is SO2. Uh, and you can work out the first one's really, really easy. It's going to be moles. Standard going to be a what? Uh, mole concentration times volume. So it's going to be 0 0.8 times by 50 over a thousand. Reasonably easy then. One one mark. You scored a mark. Yeah. Four times 10 to the minus two. So. Moles of SO2, a little bit more tricky because we need to use uh, PV equals NRT. So therefore, moles is going to be PV over RT. And we can go through, we can stick our numbers in. We've got all the relevant things there, blah, 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 blah. You know that, it's year one stuff. And that's going to give us 2.04 times 10 to the minus 2. And that's two marks, which I think if you get those, fine. The next four are tough there is I, I personally think these are really tough this is uh, I, I've certainly not covered anything like this ever um, in lessons maybe I should have done I, I, I will be doing from now on so this is ridiculous the key thing here is that it's it's it wants you to calculate the oxidation state of the vanadium in the solution after the reduction reaction with sulfur oxide so the key thing there is that the sulfur oxide the so2 the sulfur dioxide if, if it's easier to call it that the so2 is doing a bit of a bit of oxidizing sorry no it's doing some reduction sorry and itself will be oxidized now so2 will be as it reduces it will be oxidized to that so our oxidation state here is going from plus four to plus six, which means a gain of two electrons. That's quite important. A gain of two electrons. Therefore, <laughs> this is, this is, I can't believe this is so ridiculous. If we have 2.04 times 10 to the minus two, uh, sorry, Back to this one. Let me, ch let me change that. It's a it's it's a gain. It's a loss. Sorry, of of two electrons is oxidized. Sorry, it goes up oxidation state wise, but it is a loss of two electrons from each molecule, if you like, of SO2 as it goes to the SO4 two minus. So each molecule is losing two electrons. Now, if we factor that up, we could say that one mole of SO2 is therefore losing two moles of electrons. So because you therefore double it to get there, 2.04 times 10 to the minus two moles of SO2 is is losing 2.04 times 10 to the minus 2 times 2 moles of electron, which is therefore going to be 4.08 times 10 to the minus 2 moles electrons lost. <sighs> Tough. So we know if four, <laughs> ridiculous, I can't believe this question, 4.08 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of electrons have been lost from the sulfur dioxide, the SO2. Now those electrons must have been gained by the vanadium as it was reduced from, bleh, where are we, plus 5 here. So our vanadium is a plus five state there. So it's going to be reduced to something. We've got to we've got to work out what's going on. So again, if we think about the sort of the moles that are going on here, essentially our final bit here, we could say right. Well, if there's we've got four times ten to the minus two moles of vanadium. Well, if we say right, well, there's four point zero eight times ten to the minus two moles of electrons are being gained by vanadium. That pretty much equals one. So we can pretty much say, in a general term, that each mole of vanadium is gaining one mole of electrons, or each vanadium is gaining an electron ultimately. Well, if it's gaining an electron, the vanadium 
must be going from plus 5 to plus 4 because it has gained an electron in doing so. Therefore, the oxidation state finally is going to be plus 4. I honestly think that is one of the most difficult questions I've ever come across. Um, now that I'm explaining, I'm going through it, I'm sort of coming around to it slightly. It's a very particular way of thinking particularly because you've got to appreciate that our moles here, you're starting to think about the moles of electrons, which we don't normally use in calculations, don't normally talk about electrons in a in a calculation sense. But the fact that you've uh, you have lost that, you know, that many moles of electrons from the sulfur dioxide as it's been oxidized to the sulfate ions. And therefore those electrons must have gone into the vanadium and by doing this nice little bit of uh, division here, but essentially working out kind of the ratio, uh, we find that, you know, the vanadium must therefore have gained, for each mole of vanadium, they must have gained one mole of electrons, or each atom has gained one, one electron, whatever you want to say. Therefore, the oxidation state in that in increase of uh, electrons there, that gain must have gone from plus five to plus four. Tough question. I'm not going to any, spend any more time on that. Um, six marks there. Quite a lot of marks. Certainly you'd be able to get two of the marks there if you really are unhappy with the maths. Conceptually, I think that's a very, very tough question. Um, I'm dreading what's coming up now then. Question eight. It's only going to get harder, apparently. A coordinate bond is formed when a transition metal ion reacts with a ligand. Explain this coordinate bond is formed. And it's nowhere near as difficult. This is a much easier one. Uh, electron pair on ligand standard inorganic question this I'm hoping we can do some oh we have got oh, some inorganic stuff lovely really easy marks these ones four marks two marks six marks straight away which is a comparison to the last one which was considerably more difficult so anyway electron pair on the ligand uh, is donated to central metal ion two reasonably easy marks one for there one for there okay Oh, I love these questions here. These, you should absolutely just inhale these marks. Describe what you would observe when dilute aqueous ammonia is added dropwise to excess, nice, to an aqueous solution containing copper two ions. Write equations for the reactions that occur. Now, if you've seen my copper video, which is an absolute, oh, I tell you, it is, it is a monument in, in uh, cinematography. Um, we're going to start with the hexa-aqua compound. Like that. You just need to know this, by the way. And given it's the 2 plus, that's annoying. Given it's the 2 plus, it's going to form uh, H2O4 OH2 plus H2O4 plus H2 charge. We don't need there. I don't know why I've done that. Doop, doop. Don't need that because it's not forming anything at all. That's going to be solid at this point. And of course, NH4 plus because this guy has eaten up those protons. Balancing this up, 2 and 2. Nice, we'll come on to look at uh, observations in a moment. Our next bit is going to be starting with the CuH2O4 OH2. Again, reacting it with ammonia. Remember this time, this is our excess where we end up with the NH3, 4, H2O2. Charge has come back in now. And then we've got, of course, balance it up with the 2O minus the 2H2O that's been ejected from that and that's going to be 4NH3 there yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with that. In terms of colours here blue solution is going to go to blue precipitate which is going to go to what I would call a deep blue or a dark blue this of course is blue precipitate Example, they're calling it dark blue, deep blue I think is fine. Blue precipitate, dissolves, give dark blue solution. Bam, four marks, nice and easy. When the complex ion CUNH reacts with 1,2-diamino-ethane, the ammonia molecules but not the water molecules are replaced. But this is a trick question here. Uh, write an equation of this reaction, so we've got CUNH3,4H2O2,2+. Add... Okay, we've got to, fair enough, we've got to work out our email there. H two N CH two CH two NH two. You're not told that, but that's not the end of the world. H two N CH two CH two. Your biggest problem here is gonna be fit on the bloody line. 
of course we're going to have to balance this up here so I can already see that we're going to replace in there so we're going to need what four of those in there oh no hold on let me have a think about this let me have a think about this let's get the whole thing done first uh, Oh, sneaky question. Sneaky question. Oh, they are rotters. Previously an octahedral complex, we're going to retain our octahedralness. However, because this is a bidentate ligand, what we're finding here is that each one of these is acting, obviously, it's taking the place. Each one of these is taking the place of two ammonias. So actually, we only need two of these, which is going to give us. H two and CH three CH three N H two two H two O two still two plus and four N H three. I like that question. That's a sneaky question. Love a sneaky question. Appreciate that it's by dentate there. Two amino groups. Ooh. Nice. Suggest why the enthalpy change to the reaction in question 8.3, so this one here, is approximately zero. Why is it approximately zero? Well, we're essentially... Well, we're breaking and remaking CUN bonds the whole time. So we're breaking CUN bonds, and then we're remaking CUN. Um... So I would say the CUN bonds that are made and broken are the same. Um, and probably same number. Uh, I'd probably say it with same enthalpy. I should really talk about enthalpy there, I suppose. So I'd say the CUN bonds made and broken are the same with the same enthalpy and same number uh broken slash made something like that so basically the idea there's there's no, no overall change really um which is a nice one for the idea of sort of looking at things like chelate effect and entropy uh yeah so this is where they're basically going with this is that it, it's next question is explain why the reaction occurs despite having an empathy change that is approximately zero well the reason is that you're going from three molecules to five so because we're going from three to five we have an increase in entropy. Uh, so we go from three molecules to five, therefore increase in disorder, throw that in, therefore increase entropy. Uh, and it's also that it, the Mark scheme actually also says, therefore, I just do it, call it delta G. Delta G is negative, which is what we're looking for overall, because it's obviously that balance between enthalpy and entropy. We've got to almost be there now. Question nine. Five gram sample of potassium chloride was added to fifty grams of water initially at twenty degrees Celsius. The mixture was stirred, and as the potassium chloride dissolved, the temperature of the solution decreased. The type of steps you would take to determine an accurate minimum temperature that is not influenced by heat from the surroundings. Ooh. All right, it's just kind of a question, really, where you're looking at temperature changes and trying to get the actual temperature change. Always involves some sort of extrapolation uh, from a graph perspective, which is a quite a nice sort of skill to have. So if you had a graph uh, and you plotted kind of those points there you can you want to know what that point here was you could extrapolate backwards that wasn't that wasn't the greatest we'll say there extrapolate back and find out a previous point theoretically what it what it could be and that's essentially what's going on here is you you're looking at um taking some sort of readings you'd be plotting a graph and you'd be extrapolating back to this point which you can't necessarily measure directly because of influences by by external sort of conditions and whatever you've you extrapolating back to kind of almost exclude those um so what you have to do generally speaking you would need some sort of time and you've got to time something and then you've got to pl plot a graph ultimately of uh time against temperature um so if you i mean if it was if it was me yeah if it were me and i was doing this i'd be getting 
or if I was telling the students to do this, I'd be getting them to measure their temperature of water basically for about three minutes, um, taking temperature each minute. Um, I'd be getting them to add the potassium chloride at say the fourth minute. I'd be then getting them to record the temperature for minute five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, or whatever. Plot a graph, time against temperature, and extrapolate back. So I would say, uh, take temperature of water. Some of these actually don't carry marks at all. This first, but doesn't. But I think it's actually a better way of doing it. So take temperature of the water for three minutes every minute. Um, add KCL at minute four and stir, keep stirring and record temperature at minute five and every minute until minute 12 let's say now let's let's say minute 10 uh, plot graph of temp versus time extrapolate back to in this case obviously minute 4 that point where we added We'd be extrapolating back to that point there. You could, I mean, the mark scheme doesn't have you doing this pre-measurement part. They just have you starting and extrapolating back to time zero. But I quite like my method. I think it works. Um, temperature of the water decreased to 14.6 degrees Celsius. That's wonderful. To calculate a value in kilojoules per mole for the enthalpy change of solution of potassium chloride, you should assume that only 50 grams of the water change in temperature and that the specific capacity of the water is 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. Give you answer the appropriate number of significant figures. So... We're going to be looking for some sort of uh, Q equals MC delta T on this. Uh, we've got 50 grams of water. We've got 4.18. And we've got 14.6. So straight away, bish bash bosh, 1128.6 joules of energy. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this is not an enthalpy change. That is the, the, the heat change. Really, That's the energy that was uh, changed in the water. But that isn't accounted for the fact that it's uh, molar. So we need to work out our change, as it says, in kilojoules per mole. We need to work out, therefore, how many moles did we have of our potassium chloride. So, now I remember from this question we had 5 grams. So it's a 5 gram sample of potassium chloride. Moles is mass over MR. So it's going to be 5 divided by potassium chloride, which is going to be 39 Add 39.1, sorry, add 35.5, which is going to be 74.6, and that comes out of a value of 0.0670. So what I know is that for every 0 0.0670 moles of potassium chloride that dissolved, I got 1128.6 joule change. Well, let's convert this into kilojoules for a start. And that's going to be 1.1286 kilojoules, which is a much easier number. It fits certainly to our what we need up here. So, if we know that 1.1286 was from 0 0.670, well, let's just divide this. What happened to my accent there? Divide this by 0 0.0670, and that will give us per one mole. Uh, and that should give us something like 16.8. So, there we go. Stick a, a plus in there. You've got to give it to the three. If you look at all the numbers here given. Three significant figures everywhere through here. 4.18, 50.0, 14.6. So make sure you do give answers into that. And it does say that within the question. Give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. Four, I think, pretty easy marks there. It's weird how the paper goes. There was such a more difficult question on that redox one. This one is such so much more simple it's very much year one content now later in the paper bizarre um okay so we've got one here sort of tying into the thermodynamic stuff here looking at the enthalpy of dissociation of calcium chloride now and we're told the enthalpy of solution of calcium chloride is minus 82.9 the enthalpy of hydration for calcium ions for chloride ions for minus 1650 and minus 364 moles kilojoules per mole respectively Use his value to calculate a value for the lattice enthalpy of dissociation of calcium chloride. Okay. 
So lattice dissociation enthalpy would be CaCl2 going to Ca2 plus gas and 2Cl minus gas. This is the change we're trying to work out. We're given some other values. So we're given the enthalpy of solution of calcium chloride. So that would be the change of that that change there and that is minus 82.9 we're told the enthalpies of hydration for calcium ions and chloride so calcium ions are minus 1650 so that's that and chloride ions are minus 3642 though remember get that included so we're trying to work this out so we're going to go round so we're going to go with that and we're going to go against the other and that should give us our delta H which in this case is 2295.1 we'll call that 2295 in that case so not too bad there obviously it's a little bit of sort of thermochemical cycle as opposed to a big old Bourne Harbour you probably could do it Bourne Harbour-y but uh, I think you're just sort of making it man out of a molehill there. Classic sort of question there. I quite like that one though. Um, given as so they give you, they don't give you much detail besides just the actual enthalpies. You are expected to know what the enthalpy changes themselves entail, like gases to aqueous, etc. Two marks there, not a huge amount. Um, almost at the end of the paper now. A couple more questions. Explain why your answer to question 9.3 is different from the lattice enthalpy of dissociation for magnesium chloride. Uh, well, different elements for a start, surely that's that's got to go, go in there. Um, so we've got magnesium versus calcium so big differences there would be well magnesium ion is smaller than calcium ion so it's above it in the in the group in group 2 um, therefore we would expect uh, stronger ionic bonding um, and because it would basically, it would you'd have a stronger attraction between the magnesium uh, and the calcium ions, and so our values. So actually, give you any values? It doesn't, does it? No, it just says explain why. Yeah, it's a stronger ionic bond in there. Therefore, we'd have a different different value there, which is which is fairly standard. Nothing too hard there. Finally, question ten. Oh no. So table 5 shows observations of change with some test tube reactions of aqueous solutions of compounds Q, R and S with five different aqueous reagents. The initial colours of the solutions are not given. Oh God. Identify each of compounds Q, R and S. You are not required to explain your answers. Right, let's go straight through then. Q. Bam, 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 bam. Okay, so when we had... It's not a sulfate. It's got no. Oh, it has a halide here, pale cream. So cream. So it's got to be bromide. So whatever we've got here has to be bromide. Okay, white precipitate there would be calcium or magnesium because obviously this one's here. We'd assume it's going to be aluminium, so we can put that on that too now. So. We'll call it calcium bromide. Could be magnesium. Um, I'll put calcium slash magnesium bromide. Could be bromide though. Uh, white precipitate, so it's got to be chloride, aluminium from this bit here. S, white precipitate here, so I'm assuming we've got a sulfate involved, so we'll put that down. I'm a pH man, not an F, but there we go. Uh, brown precipitate with sodium hydroxide, so we would imagine there's so iron three ions, um, and that's back to sort of the whole kind of idea of the inorganic aqueous ions and all that. So iron three sulfate, six marks, unbelievable. Last question, almost there. Right ionic equation for each of the positive observations with S. Oh, crying out loud. So S, we're looking for 
the sulfate reaction and the sodium hydroxide reaction. So, first one, the sulfate one, really easy. Barium sulfate, the barium meal being produced from the reaction there. Iron one, a bit more tricky. Uh, but it's just your standard inorganic stuff there. So OH minus going to Fe, H2O3, OH3, and 3H2O. What else have we got occurring there? Oh, we've got other stuff as well, haven't we? Oh, no. Brown precipitate bubbles of a gas. Okay, right, so that one's fine. I'd forgotten we've got all those reactions as well. Um, iron equations, obviously. Standard, standard, standard. Fe, H2O, same product. Just remember that it's going to be 3, 2, 2, 3 CO2, 3 H2O. There's our bubbles of gas. And then finally the chloride one. Didn't cover this in my video, but you can't cover everything. and It's not through me being terrible. It's just they can ask what they want, really. Fe, Cl4. Probably going to get rid of that. Uh, minus... Uh, 6H2O bam 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 on equations done end of questions oh. long video hopefully that's been of some help at all obviously comments uh, tweet them comment on the bottom whatever uh, very long video skip to where you need to go uh, as I say though, I do hope that's been of some help at all uh, and that has been paper one from specimen set one